All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the That's Not Real Trek Watch Party Podcast. This is episode number 15. My name is Scotty, also known as EBC, directly below me, the beautiful short and sweet, who sometimes goes by the name of Veronica, uh, but only when she's like, incognito. And uh, That's right. Yeah. And, and nobody knows what the hell is going on. I'm just as confused <laughs> as the rest of you, so... Uh, all right, so we are rapidly approaching the end of Discovery Season 2, and that's going to be important for a couple of different reasons. So um, we actually only have three episodes left, and that is uh, Episode 12, Through the Valley of Shadows, and Episodes 13 and 14, Such Sweet Sorrow Part 1 and Part 2. So two-parter episode to finish out the season. Um, and then uh, an event happens in Discovery history that we're going to learn about tonight that completely alters everything else that happens with the rest of the Discovery series. So we're going to find out about that tonight as they're starting to wrap up this this season two story arc with the red angel and the signals and spock and all of this other stuff um and what it's going to mean to the future of the discovery crew and and we're going to start to get into that uh especially with such sweet sorrow um but last time we left off here um the uh the red angel was captured we found out it was Burnham's mom, who she definitely has some issues with. Uh, lots of uh, relationship tension unresolved, and Burnham completely and utterly trying to save the entire universe, uh, even though she has probably doesn't have the ability to do most of that. <laughs> <laughs> She's got to fix everything. Serious character flaw. We discussed that, too, uh, two weeks ago when we did this. Mm -hmm. so because of her her dead mommy issue <laughs> yeah yeah i mean it's like okay so you you thought this entire time your parents was were dead now you find out that your mom has been alive this whole time but kind of like out of the, the 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 time period she's been in the future and now you're already on this war path to try to save her from herself and from the entire you know you know it's just like, okay, really, you're, you're not going to be able to fix every single problem in the universe by yourself. Um, so I think, um, now, now I have seen into, I think, most of season three. I, th I think I finished season three. Um, but we hopefully next season i i believe we start to see some more major character development in burnham where she starts to tamp that down a bit um if i recall correctly it's been a while so because they they got season four out now and and season five is in production and i have not seen any of season four in fact after we started this podcast back in june I uh, purposefully did not watch anything else new that has come out since then. So I haven't seen Picard Season 2. I haven't seen Picard... Well, Picard Season 3 is coming out in, in March. I only watched uh, Season 1 of the, the first animated show, Lower Decks, which I really love that. Um, but now they've got Seasons 2 and 3 coming out here. Uh, yeah, so there's there's a lot of stuff. And I've actually had to alter the schedule that I was writing as all this newer stuff came out and I'm trying to keep track of, you know, what's going, what's supposed to be going where. So, yeah. All right. So, uh, here we go with, uh, episode 12 through the Valley of shadows. Are you freezing again? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Captain, take impression. Yeah. 
Yeah. We're not even to the cold part yet. I mean, there's there's still a whole winter ahead of us, you know? I'm going to freeze yeah. to death. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, uh, we found out uh, that one, Leland was not the only person who was infected by the AI nanites. Um, I, I don't even remember this guy because apparently he was just in the first episode as the, uh, armory officer or ta tactical officer on the Shenzhou. Um, mm -hmm. but he apparently then went to section 31 and was on this ship and then was, it almost was like he was used. In fact, I would, I would say, yeah, he probably was used to be a person that Burnham was familiar with to maybe lower her guard. So it seems like yeah. it seems like the AI is like three steps ahead of them in saying this is, you know, if I'm going to capture Burnham, okay, so we're going to send this thing where the update for the ship is 10 minutes late and it's going to pique their interest and we think that's going to have Burnham come here to investigate and she does and and all of it was a trap to get at Burnham and it's because the AI has identified her as a threat to its plan, the only threat that can possibly stop the AI completely. Um, so uh, I thought that was very interesting and well executed, the, the story as it was laid out here with them not knowing what this is and going to the ship and finding out it was all a plot just to get her, and and then ultimately failing and and i thought th this is probably like the first time i've seen really good acting on the part of sonequa martin green where she's laying back there with the phaser and and you know just doing everything and, and getting more and more anxious as it gets closer and closer and and spock is doing his thing and and only finally gets it at the last minute and i'm sure we've seen that trope you know many times before just a, as a tension builder and things, but I thought she pulled that off really well. Um, did you have any thoughts about that whole scenario? Yeah, I agree. I, I think that uh, Control, Control definitely, definitely used, used, like, just her recognition of him and, uh, you know, to just try to get her to trust, and mm -hmm. then she fell right into the trap. Um, but and I thought it was cool that you know Spock did the magnets. You know she shot she shot a hole in him and it was just like right. healing itself on its own. But then he's like, oh, computers, magnets, this is the answer. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and extremely reminiscent of Borg technology. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it, even uh, even using nanites, like saying nanites. Yeah. Because yeah. I mean, they they didn't do it until much later in TNG. Like, anything with the Borg in the main part of the TNG series was always an abduction and then, you know, some kind of surgical process. Mm -hmm. And then later, and I, th I think it was in um, First Contact that they then introduced the concept of uh, an infection through nanites, and, and they would have these, like, tubules coming out of their hand to plunge into a neck or something to deliver these nanites, and then it would just spread in the body. And and then that became a, a big part of the basis for how the Borg were represented in Voyager, with Seven of Nine and the Borg Queen and everything that they did. Um, so... We don't really have any information, or at least no concrete information, on what this AI is and what its origins were in the future when it came back. But I, I'd i bet some serious money that it's somehow at least Borg-related. Well, yeah, because didn't they use time travel? Um, yeah, they used it in First Contact to try to mm -hmm. intercept things, so it would add up. Yeah, but it's them. Um, it just uh, yeah, there's there's too many similarities there. So I I would be actually kind of surprised if the creators were trying to go for a whole separate entity there. Um, even uh, there were some insinuations um, that uh, and I think most of this was in like the novels that William Shatner wrote. 
uh, there was some insinuation that in, in Star Trek The Motion Picture, Voyager, uh, or Voyager, which was the Voyager that had been transformed by the an AI, that was later explained as also being part of Borg technology, although it was kind of like a different branch. Yeah. Um, so, of course, none of that is like standard, you know, uh, top of the line Paramount uh, canon, but... You know, in an attempt to fill in some of these plot holes, I think um, a lot could be explained. It could be just like different factions of the Borg or different styles that we haven't really seen yet. But uh, mm -hmm. the similarities are uncanny, I think. Um, and and I remember seeing um, some of those first episodes of TNG with the Borg years ago when I was a teenager and how scary the Borg were at that yeah. point in the 90s, you know, before great CGI and all these other things that they had in the movies, um, just the, uh, the way they were presented. It was one, one of the few TNG episodes that I think they were going for scary and they got it. And I, I think I remember seeing an interview with, um, I don't know, one of the, you know, uh, Brandon Braga or you know, whoever back in the day talking about um, the design of the Borg and how uneasy it makes people feel because they are not, um, how do you say, uh, one side matches the other. They're like the, they're asymmetrical. A asymmetrical. Yeah, that's where yeah. I was looking for, asymmetrical. So, so that quality of it is, is, you know, they go for that. And I've seen that in m multiple things too, but, um, you know, the, the kind of technology that they're talking about, and, and this seems like very related to all of that. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so far I have not seen, and, and like I said, I went into season three, uh, once they wrap the storyline up, it's kind of finished. And they never explain it off as something being Borg uh, or, or related to the Borg. But I, I bet my uh, second to last bottom dollar that uh, there's something there at least. Um, and, and that this was at the very least them trying to make a new iteration of the Borg in, in a brand new series. Um, so did you have any other thoughts on, on that whole influence? It could be like a predecessor. Like it could be like this is how the Borg got started, and then they took all these different AIs and merged them all into one. Um, and and then we got like what our version, the TNG version of the Borg is. So maybe it's just like an early like evolutionary stage of yeah of the yeah, Borg. Yeah, that's very possible. Yeah. All right, uh, so we got that to deal with, and, and it seems like uh, this AI that they're fighting keeps ratcheting it up, and, you know, we uh, leave the episode there with them facing 30, Section 31 ships, and unfortunately, they're... 31! We don't, yeah, we don't know that there, it, it, there might be 31, 30, Section 31 ships, but <laughs> uh, hard to say. Um or, or maybe there is 31, and there's 30 coming after them now, and the one is the one that Burnham and Spock were just Ooh. on that was missing. So, yeah, mm -hmm. we don't know. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, 30 sh I mean, you talk about ratcheting up the tension here. They're now uh, Discovery is facing its greatest threat, and that is AI-controlled ships, 30 of them bearing down on them, and Burnham says, "Okay, the only way that we, can, uh, the only option I can see to fight this is to just blow up the ship," you know. <laughs> so, um, let me ask you this: What have you thought of in the past? This trope in Star Trek, in particular, of a last resort being we're going to set off the self destruct. What what is it? What have you seen that as, and what does it mean to you? Yeah, they've used it. I mean, they've used it a lot in TNG um, as like a last resort yeah, if I they're out I, of options. I think I re 
recall three or four instances in the TNG series. Yeah, and it, it just seems like in this one, they don't look for other alternatives. It's just like, okay, we're just, we're just going to blow up the ship. <laughs> but, you know, in the other ones, it seems like they exhaust multiple different um, ideas, and then and then it comes to, like, all right, blow up the ship, which they never do really go through with it. It's, it's always some deus ex machina thing comes right. in and... You know, then. <laughs> Can you remember anything in Star Trek that you've seen where they actually went through with it? I I can't I can't. Think Was of that it. episode a cause and effect where they where they kept looping? Did they end up blowing the ship up in that one? Mm -mm. No. No, that was um. That was Data, at the last minute in the last loop, made a decision against what they thought they should do, and that ended the loop. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I'd have to... It's been so long, I'd have to go back and, like... Yeah, but I, that's what I'm saying. I'm racking my brain. I can't think of an instance where they actually went through with it. Yeah. Unless I'm... Well, they always get down to, like, you know, 10-second countdown, yeah. and it gets real close, and... <laughs> yeah. Well, and I mean, that says something. If if all they've been using it all along is as a tension builder, okay, that's great. But, you know, now now in, in the, uh, uh, where are we now? We are in the 56th year of Star Trek history. I think it's about time, if we haven't had it already, that they just go ahead and blow up the damn ship, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh... <laughs> You know, which one are we going to use that for? So I'll have to do some more research on that, but I can't think of an instance, at least not in Paramount canon, you know, video history. Um, doesn't doesn't ring a bell, but I may, I yeah. may be mistaken on that. But yeah, it's it's been utilized quite a few times. So so I, I'm, I'm pretty sure we can assume that that's not going to happen at this point. <laughs> Probably not. Discovery <laughs> is not going to blow up in the next episode. Uh, we'll we'll find some other way to get around it, you know. And then go like three more seasons with the same name of the ship that's gone and yeah. not there anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're we're still going to call it Star Trek Discovery, but now we're on the USS Buchanan or something, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, but uh, uh, you know what that that does bring to mind though, uh. The, the fact that this is, I think, the first time where we didn't have a set crew that was there through the whole series. I mean, we, we yeah. essentially followed the crew of the Shenzhou, and quite a few of those people then being put onto the Discovery, and then Burnham mm -hmm. reunites after the whole mutiny thing. But then we lose Lorca after season one, and Pike comes in. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and there's more changes like that coming about. So that, that follows more of the style that I think, um, The Walking Dead set the standard for with main characters that just aren't going to be there after a while. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I, I think that's a really interesting form of uh, storytelling that, you know, that was never really expo explored in properly in television before. I mean, you, you always had this sort of thing where, if a main character died, it was usually, like, the end of a season or the end of the series or something like that. I mean, yeah, we lost Tasha Yar in, in season one or season two, whatever that was. Uh, but we didn't lose Data until the, la the very last movie, you know. And then they said, hey, this is something that we want to build in to make the story very climactic, and it worked, and all that. And even then, in the new Picard stuff, date is still there, but just in a different right. form, you know. It's uh, B, what is it, B4 or B2 or whatever it was. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, and there's more. I, did you see the Picard Season 3 trailer? I didn't watch the trailer. I oh. did see the news that Moriarty's back. Yes. Uh, yeah, so that'll that'll be cool. <laughs> and and I'll go ahead and spoil part of it. Also in the trailer, we see lore. Ooh, Ooh. nice. 
Yes. Uh, but we'll get to that later, you know. Um, at least uh, uh, the schedule as it is now, if we if we don't delay anymore, which I'm sure we will at some point, uh, we're going to be starting Picard in March, shortly after Season 3 comes out. So season, season 3 will be out and we'll just be able to watch the entirety of Picard and go through it as is. So it should be a lot of fun. All right. Um, and then uh, the last point was uh, Stamets. Uh, still pining after his dear doctor, who's now abusive and violent, and uh, yeah, <laughs> and uh, uh, Janet Reno, or uh, is that her name? Reno, I can't Jet. remember. Jet Reno, yeah. Yeah, Jet. I always want to call her Janet Reno. I don't know. That's that's like a lawyer <laughs> somewhere or something. Jet Reno. We'll just call her uh, Reno, and. Um, mm. I love the actress that plays her, um, but um, basically going in and, and browbeating Culber into stop denying your fucking feelings because you're not going to get another chance like this. My wife died. What the fuck is wrong with you, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, I can't remember for sure, but I think Culber starts to take that to heart and now they're going to try to maybe rekindle some of that lost love that mm -hmm. it was never Stamets' fault in the first place so so it's just kind of this thing that was shoved into his lap and he has to deal with yeah um so that's about it all right any other thoughts on that episode before we move on no that's about it okay all right so uh then our second episode is Episode 14, Such Sweet Sorrow, Part 1. Here we go. All right. Cliffhanger indeed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> up in there <laughs> um well so the first thing that comes to mind is that we definitely had uh, a basis of a story that required a two-parter like there there was so much going on here i mean they, even just the last 20 minutes being everybody saying their goodbyes and getting their feelings out and yeah. Everything that went along with that because there there's this this massive rift that is now occurring between the two segments of the crew, those staying behind and those going into the future. Okay. Um so did you have any thoughts on like um the the people that agreed to stay on Discovery as it goes into the future? It's kind of surprising. I mean, a lot of them were really young and seem like they had family uh they're all like writing letters to their loved ones mm -hmm. and um that, i thought that was kind of strange that so many of them uh were kind of in that situation and then that that um tyler is just like oh yeah i'm i'm not going <laughs> um yeah, I, I think with any of the, like, the unexplored possibilities of a, a re-engagement relationship between Burnham and Tyler, it's like, um, it, it all had to be summed up in that last kiss. Like, they, they, there definitely was more between them and everything that they had to do to work through their issues to maybe get back to something like that, but now the whole scenario has changed and they're just not going to be able to do it, so that's all they have left is that kiss. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I got to hand it to Sonequa Martin-Green. That that probably was uh, an excellent execution of that, how that scenario you would expect it to play out with her walking away and then coming back and doing that and then just you know very curtly walking away entirely. Yeah. Um, so, so that I was, uh, kind of impressed with. Um, did you catch, uh, the, uh, relevance to, uh, Pike in the last episode seeing this, uh, vision of him 
uh, you know, in the wheelchair and his face melting and all that, uh, the, the relevance to what's happening in this uh, episode? Well, I is he trying to change the future by staying behind? Um, best I can tell, what he's trying to do is place himself in a position where he's going to be able to do the most good for Starfleet, and, and, and the same with Tyler, but from a different perspective. And, and you, you saw Tyler there standing on the transporter pad saying he's got to leave. He's not going to be involved in this battle, at least not like the rest of the crews are. Um, yeah. So I think uh, that that essentially was Pike uh, admitting to himself and accepting the fact that this is placing him on this path mm -hmm. to where he, he is going to be that at some point in the future. And, and, and that's basically him saying, okay, let, let you know, I accept that. Let's move on. Yeah. Um. And and also with this whole two part episode is that okay, we came up with our plan, and and there's no other way. Mm -hmm. uh, and now we've said our goodbyes, and now everything that's left to wrap everything up is actually in in the next and final episode of the season. Yeah. Um, so yeah, definitely a cliffhanger, but I mean, it that's uh I think it was necessary what they did in in the episode layout to to place all of the pieces in position for now what we know is coming this battle and hopefully the saving of the universe. Um right. by Burnham taking discovery into the future and out of the reach of this AI. Mhm. Mm so, at the very least, I think uh, Tyler, what he's taking on himself at this moment is that he's got to do something that is going to be two steps ahead in, if they are successful, they're just still going to have to stop this AI right. in, in the current timeline. And, and Pike's probably definitely going to play a part in that, and Cornwell and anybody else that's on the Enterprise. Um, and, and everything else relies on Burnham being able to take Discovery into the future to stop that end of things, and that's all they're going to be able to do. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what did you think of, um, Culber deciding that he was going to leave on the Enterprise? I thought that, um, I, I was a little surprised that he didn't want to go to the future and, you know, kind of make a new life for himself, but he is still, I, I guess, accepting that he's moving on. So maybe he thinks there's like just a little, a little strand of hope there <laughs> that he's trying to hang on to that. Yeah, potentially. I mean, we don't know what's available in the future either. Hell, they didn't mm -hmm. even assign a, an actual time to where Discovery is going or where Burnham right. is going in Discovery following. They're just like, oh, yeah, it could be 700 years in the future. It could be tomorrow. We don't know, you know. Um, yeah. Talk about flying by the seat of your pants. Um, mm -hmm. Well, it also gets him away from the uh, the spore drive. You know, he doesn't have to deal with that anymore. He, right. He's not going to be <laughs> fucked up. <laughs> yeah, so you you figured that Piloting out. Piloting the uh, ship, yeah. And, and that was something I'd been referring to for a while now is, you know, we, we don't know anything about the spore drive prior to this presentation of Discovery. And there's a reason for that, and that's that's because, yes, it existed at this, and it was experimental, and it worked, but then Discovery leaves, and it's no longer in this time, and, and that, I think that's all part and parcel with, like, Pike saying, yeah, the holographic systems are offline completely because they were causing so many problems with the new uh, circuitry in the Enterprise, so it's essentially 
you know, them tying up the loose ends in the story to reset it to what Star Trek was back in 1966. So maybe they didn't do a perfect job like that, you know, because obviously they redesigned the Enterprise bridge and uh, it looks great as hell. I I, I thought Oh, was, yeah, it looks fantastic. Yeah, the, the amount of detail and effort to put in to make it so that it had... Uh, all of the design elements from the original series, like the red railing going around the sunken pit and, uh, you know, the the positioning of the turbo lift door and all this other stuff, um, but still, you know, having the modern technology look and, and you know, bringing it into this age, uh, literally uh, 50 years after the original was, was put together. Um which it, I also thought was a big part of the reason why J.J. Abrams, when he came out with the Star Trek movie in 2009, should have been applauded because, yeah, they redesigned the Enterprise and made it look a little, it wasn't exactly the same, but I thought he did an excellent job of bringing modern technology into the look and feel of what that was supposed to be. Um, yeah, definitely. So, that in and itself... Um, you know, should yeah. again, this is where I, I bring in this the, the the people that say this is not real trick because it doesn't match this or that. Well, it doesn't have to. That's the whole point. Right. We could put a modern twist, a modern spin on things, and have it look nice and shiny, and it doesn't have to be the exactly same thing it was before. Because right. I mean, they weren't going to be able to make anything look as as fancy as they did the Enterprise Bridge in this back 50 years ago. So, right. what's the problem? I don't I don't see one at all, you know. Did you uh, have any further thoughts on that aspect of it? I mean, I think it's just like the nostalgia and people like to live in the past and are resistant to change. And, you know, some people are more stubborn about it than others. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, even uh, going back to J.J. Uh, Abrams' Star Trek, um, the way Scotty was presented, played by Simon Pegg, uh, just uh, breathed a whole new life into that character. Because, yeah, there was, there was a lot of great things that Jimmy Doohan did with uh, Scotty's character, especially into the movies, but... Simon Pegg really added a whole new twist and a whole new flavor that was, in my opinion, very welcome. You know, and I think he did it justice. Um, especially the comedy aspects of, of Scotty's character, you know. For sure. So, yeah, I mean, as far as that goes, uh, I really have to applaud the creators and say, you know, you, you did right by it. There's... <laughs> maybe some issues with plot scenarios or storyline or Burnham crying every other second or whatever, you know, getting over her complex. But I, I think in creating Discovery, they really did the entire franchise justice. And they're not done yet, either. Right. Um, so there's still, still so much more to this. Um... So, uh, the, the basic plot points that they wanted to cover in this is that, one, we're going to build a second Red Angel suit. The first one was built by Burnham's parents at the behest of Section 31. This was their, their engineering concept, and it was put together by her parents and made a reality. Requires the, uh, energy of a, uh... A supernova, uh, and in particular a supernova from a uh, red dwarf, and um, the I thought it was an absolutely fantastic aspect that they brought from the one episode of the short treks, the Queen of Zahida Poe, back in an actual mainline canon episode to not only reprise her role, and that's why we watched that back when, even though they, it came out afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, it, because, one, not only does she have the solution to that, 
And anybody that watched the short trick and now is watching this is, is going to say, yes, that all makes sense. Mm -hmm. And and we have an understanding of why everything is laid out the way it is. Uh, one, her being a complete and utter scientific genius, she can do particle physics basically in her head. And okay. yeah. <laughs> um, and, and the acknowledgement of that from Jet Reno who is probably mm -hmm. the the most advanced scientific, uh, at least engineering wise, mind on on discovery uh, at the moment, mm -hmm. and um, and then actually coming up with the solution to their problem, and then we find out that all of this is due to a time paradox that Burnham take is to take this second suit. And she's the one responsible for the red signals. And then, just at the right moment, a fifth red signal appears above Zahia so that they know to go and talk to Poe in order to get the solution to their problem. So, yet again, we have to ask, as we do in a time paradox situation, what came first? How how yeah. did Burnham know to go to the future to come back to make the signal and and let them know you know, um, <laughs> and uh, I don't know that they're ever going to come up with a solution for that. <laughs> yeah, it's just a a matter of you know hey we're gonna build that into the plot and let it run you know. <laughs> um, so so that also seems to explain why. They were getting uh, almost conflicting data on the DNA of who the Red Angel was. They thought it was Burnham's pattern, but it turned out to be her mother. And it turns out that there's actually two Red Angels, and one of them is actually Burnham. It's Burnham, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can we can we get a little more convoluted here? It's not quite convoluted enough, you know. Not Burnham. It is Burnham. Yeah. You know, it's Burnham's sister. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Something like that. Her twin sister that was also raised by Sarah, and we <laughs> we never heard about her either. <laughs> yeah. Um. So yeah, now now Burnham is faced with this, and and then they start going into you know what it means to her character. She's essentially going to have to leave everybody behind, and that that then prompts this division where we have uh, a whole bunch of people willing to follow her and and make sure that everything goes according to plan and, and potentially even bringing her and this entire group back to a normal point in the timeline as well. So that's also a potential thing moving into season three is if they do, are they are successful in going there. And as you pointed out, Spock wanting to go into the future, well, that clearly didn't happen because... Spock is back on the Enterprise in 1966, so right. uh, we 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 <laughs> definitely something went wrong. <laughs> yeah, something went wrong. We we definitely need to consult Dr. Emmett Brown and Michael J. Fox about what the hell is going on here because these <laughs> these time paradoxes are. <laughs> yeah, we need to go back to the future, man. It's a wibbly wobbly. Yeah. All right, so uh, that pretty much wraps it all up that that leads us into this uh, cliffhanger into the finale the last episode of season two that we will consider next week uh did you have any other thoughts on all of that or anything I no, missed? I'm, excited. I'm excited for the next episode i think that it's probably the most um kind of like dramatic leading up that we've had so far to uh mm. to the next uh one so yeah excited to see what happens there yeah and um, at the very least, I mean, you've got the uh, main part of the plot that is dependent on, yes, we need to save the universe again, and this is how we're going to try to do it, and does it work, does it not work, what happens. Clearly, there's some kind of issue we need to resolve with Spock not going to the future. Uh, but then also, um, oh, what was I going to say? 
lost my train of thought. Oh, uh, what this means to Discovery going into the future. Like we were talking about wrapping up these plot points where they, there's a seeming contradiction. Burnham never being uh, mentioned as Spock's sister or being raised by Sarek and Amanda. Uh, never ever hearing about m this more modern technology that, that supposedly existed pre-original uh, uh, series uh, where, you know, we've got holographics and, you know, touch screens and all this other stuff that doesn't exist in, in the original Star Trek, and certainly not a, a spore drive. Um, what happens that all of that is not mentioned, and they're trying to make that fit the canon? So, so maybe that could be answered by Discovery going into the future, and then Starfleet's like, zip it, it never existed, by, um, But there's more to that. And and that it, I think it does really specifically deal with Spock's role in all of this. All right. Um, so next week, that will be part two of Such Sweet Sorrow. That's uh, episode 14, the final episode in Discovery Season 2. Uh, and then... Uh, We've got three more of the short treks. And that's going to be two of them dealing very specifically with the Enterprise crew. Uh, Captain Pike, number one, and Mr. Spock. And another uh, character that we're going to be introduced to. And then another one that doesn't exactly fit into anything else that we're looking at but it definitely needs to be looked at called Ephraim and Dot and that is uh, an animated short and it actually spans uh, quite a large period of time and we'll get more into the details of that next week and then we are actually abandoning the Discovery series for quite some time uh, so We'll discuss that next week as well, why we're doing that and and what the meaning of it is and why Cage can kiss my ass because uh, there's a specific reason why I did that yeah. and you're going yeah. to deal with it because that's the reality of the situation. You go watch it by yourself. I don't care. <laughs> um, but yeah, and putting this together, I mean, obviously I'm doing this in, in a chronological order that's a big part of that is discovery is going into the future so uh, you know maybe we have a clue there that they are going and staying uh maybe something else happens we don't know especially with spock something something happens with spock that he's left behind at least so we have to figure out what all of that means and then we'll address why we're abandoning discovery for the moment in order to continue where we are in the current timeline which will be then the following week starting Strange New Worlds with Captain Pike's uh, the first five-year mission on the Enterprise. So, that's pretty much it. Anything else? No. Okay. Well, from me. All right. All right, well, thanks for uh, joining. We'll see you next week uh, for the last episode of Season 2 of Discovery. Woohoo! Ready? See Bye. ya.